Well, thanks so much. Uh, this has been brilliant. Wow, my head is spinning. I, these talks were fantastic, and uh, I think I have like 10 new ideas for projects. I'm looking forward to more interaction and more discussions. So when, when Benoit asked me for a talk, I first took a very sort of, um, you know, normal, conventional title, but I actually like this one better. Um, we heard a lot about flat structures that pop into 3D, and we heard a lot about frustration and metric frustration. Um, so I'm going to talk about that as well, and I'm very grateful for the people who came before me because that means I can skip a few parts. We had excellent explanation of some of the concepts that I wanted to introduce. Um, but first, I want to thank um, the organizers, Benoit, and everybody else for in creating this fantastic event. I think it's always brilliant when people come together from different disciplines, and I think a lot of the excitement and uh, you know, real innovation happens at the interface of different disciplines. Um, my work is also at the interface of multiple dif disciplines. I'm in computer science, but I, you know, I'm fascinated by geometry. In particular, the kind of geometric structures that you see in nature. So we take a lot of inspiration from nature, but also from art and design. So we work with artists and designers, and just generally, I'm just fascinated by these brilliant forms that we see um, around us. Um, and then we try to combine this with modern techniques for making. Um, so digital fabrication technology that allows us now to create some of these geometries um, in you know, unprecedented um, detail. But then the bulk of my work is in computer science. So we're trying to bring geometry and making together by designing algorithms for optimization, for design, for interactive exploration. And today, because we're at the Design Biennale, I was thinking I focus on the uses of some of these techniques for design. And just, you know, if anything you see in this talk uh, is inspiring for you, please reach out. I'm always happy to, you know, discuss more. Uh, not only do you have a chance to talk with me, but you also have a chance to talk with almost everyone from my team who are here. So there's, raise your hands, people. Uh, so these are my brilliant students, and uh, I'm very excited that they're here, because most of what I will talk about is their work or the work of some of their predecessors uh, and collaborators. Um, so, you know, Many people were involved in this. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into technical details, but if you're interested in the more you know, computational aspects of some of the things I'll talk about here, is, you know, some of the references, please visit our website. We also strive hard to bring our code uh, you know, to a general audience, so we're trying to build more interfaces, more usable software, so that people can, can build upon this work. And as I mentioned, we do collaborate with designers and artists, and you will also find on our webpage a number of design studies, um, pieces that we did in collaboration with, with a number of people. So you know, I encourage you to check those out. I will not be able to cover all of this here today. So let me start with another person that you've met already. <laughs> and thanks to Iran, I can keep this short. Of course, Gauss, you know, um, very famous mathematician who laid the foundations of differential geometry, as Aaron explained. Um, curvature is a key principle that we've also talked about, so I can go through this quickly. You know, if you have a beam that bends, we can measure the curvature by sort of fitting a circle, and you know, the more a beam bends, the tighter the circle will be. So it's the inverse of the radius of that circle that determines curvature. Um, we're mostly interested in surfaces, so again, you know, almost like a repetition. You can check if you paid attention in the morning. Um, we have this key concept of Gaussian curvature, that allows us to classify surfaces, right? So we can determine whether a surface is flat, locally flat, uh, or whether it has negative curvature, like a saddle shape or positive curvature. And I don't have to remind you of Gauss's remarkable theorem, um, which I paraphrase here, which is basically to say, you know, if we can measure lengths within a surface, we can actually determine curvature. And this is a very deep result indeed, and the basis of a lot of scientific innovation that came afterwards, you know, even things like Einstein's general theory of relativity would not be possible with these kind of insights. And obviously, it gives us a tool not just to analyze surfaces, but to also control surfaces. So this is the whole premise of a lot of the shape morphing we've seen here today and also in some of the previous talks. Um, so this is the, the tool that we explored as well. And you know, these things we've kind of seen, if I take a flat disk and I expand it, there is this metric frustration which makes it pop into a three-dimensional shape. Or if I have a setup like this, we'll get a more saddle-shaped deployment. And we've also seen this morning 
are beautiful examples of, of plant growth where you have exactly these kind of effects, that something grows in the plane at different rates, and then as a result of equalizing the internal tension of the surface um, with this metric change, you, you know, create surfaces that buckle out into free space. Or here is another example um, that uses these expansive hydrogels. So um, in our work, we are exploiting similar principles. I'm taking a slice of our recent research um, to show you um, these various works. And basically what we're looking at is different kinds of geometric and mechanical principles that allow us to induce this sort of metric change. So I'll walk you through a number of examples, and some of those are reminiscent of what we've already seen. The first type of um, change of metric we're going to look at is isotropic expansion. So um, changing things uniformly in all directions. The second one is non-isometric or non-isotropic, so anisotropic contraction. We've also seen that one. And the last one I'll look at is a sort of shearing transformation that also changes uh, the internal metric. And there's a number of different projects with very different type of uh, material systems that exploit these type of principles. So let me start with the oxetics. Um, so this project came about just looking generally at flexible materials. So I have a lot of props, but because I never knew whether I would be able to show them, I also have things in video. If you have a flexible sheet like this, we know we can bend it very easily. It doesn't want to stretch. So wrapping it around a sphere is very difficult because it has you know, zero curvature. It can bend in one direction, but not in two directions at the same time. Kirigami was mentioned just before. So as we introduce cuts into this material, we can now generate um, a material that actually allows metric change, that allows length to change. And this gives us the opportunity to induce curvature. So we can now wrap this material around a sphere um, and actually conform to this double curved shape. Now the geometric sort of abstraction of this is that of a triangular linkage. And we call these oxetics, or these materials are called oxetics because they have this negative Poisson ratio. If you expand them in one direction, they also expand in the other direction. So you saw this example of the sphere. And if we look a bit closer at Gauss's theorem, the connection between the metric and curvature, it actually becomes clear that it's the variation of this change of distance that creates curvature. Right? If I look at this linkage and I've expanded everywhere the same, I will stay in the plane. So here you see you know, certain parts of this linkage open more than others, and that means there's more expansions in some region and less in others. And this is something that we can use computationally to do more interesting things than spheres. Uh, so here, if you take some geometric model of this space, we can then precisely calculate what the shape of the flat domain needs to look like and what it needs to deform into or how much it needs to stretch everywhere to perfectly conform to this shape. So again, you see that these hexagonal openings, so if I take you know, this, oops, um, you know, this linkage pattern, the, the amount of opening that I do varies across the surface so that we get this variation in extension. And then you can do other things with this here again, um, a flat pattern that can be deformed into this double curved shape um, based on these calculations that we've done. So this is all well and nice. Um, so you can you know, deform into various shapes and you can solve these inverse problems of given a shape, what does the pattern look like? But it's actually not easy to create these surfaces physically. Because if you look at this half sphere, um, I can calculate how much I need to open every hexagon, but it's kind of painful to do this, right? You would need to be very precise. If you deviate a little bit from this opening, then the surface will actually look quite different. So how can we automatically actuate or deploy such a structure? And fortunately, there's a very simple trick that we can use. Again, the, the, the system that you have here is all equal triangles, but different openings. So we can turn this around and say, what if we had all the same openings, but different triangles? Okay, so in this example that you see on the bottom right, um, the pattern is fully open everywhere, but the triangles have different sizes. And that means now that the flat material actually has this hemispherical shape programmed into it. So you see the pattern now varies across the surface. And you can imagine that in a region like on the left, 
there's not much stretching that is possible anymore because these triangles are already open, but on the right, it's fully closed, so we can still expand a lot. And as we actually found out after this project, this principle is also explored in nature. So this is one of these beautiful drawings in um, Ernst Haeckel's book that I can encourage you to um, check out. It's, it's, it's very nice. So now we can take that principle and use automatic deployment. So for example, um, we can use any sort of force that expands things. One that I can use here is gravity. If I want to design a hanging structure like this, our algorithm can then calculate the patterns on the surface and the corresponding 2D pattern where you see the varying sizes of triangles. Now we can build a prototype where here we just cut these out of um, plastics and connected them with ring binders. And once you hang the structure, gravity will make sure it opens up and exactly conforms to the shape that we programmed it to conform into. So now you don't have to do anything, it sort of actuates itself. Um, so gravity is nice, but of course a little bit limiting. We also looked at other types of actuation, for example, inflation. Again, our algorithm can compute and optimize for the pattern on the surface and the corresponding flat pattern. And now we built a little frame to, to actuate it, just using a generic rubber balloon. And this balloon doesn't know anything about the shape that we care about, but if we now put the oxidic surface on top of it, it constrains the extraction or the expansion exactly to the amount that we need to assume this shape. So here you see the two combined, and as I inflate, once the hexagons are fully opened, right, once I'm in the state where everything is expanded, I can't move anymore without tearing the surface. So that's where this program shape is then assumed automatically. Of course, this is um, an actuated structure with inflation, so if we take the pressure out, it'll collapse back. Why is that? Because these type of oxetics are actually elastic materials. So here you see uh, an example of these. If I pull them out, you know, there is deformation going on at the hinges, and when I let go, they want to go back. All right? um, but there is a slight uh, modification we can make to this pattern using a very interesting principle that we're exploiting in, in various ways in our work now, and that is that of bistability. So if I take this pattern and modify it into a slightly different structure, now I pull it open, this pattern does not go back to its original shape. This is now a state that has higher energy than the initial state, but there's a barrier in between. So you can let go, it sits in a local minimum, it's not going to contract back. And we can use this in our work. So here you see a um, laser cut um, silicon surface with a pattern in it. And now I can actuate it. It's very flexible material, as you would see. I can actuate it just by shaking it. And now all of these cells open, but they don't want to contract back. So now I can program this shape into the material, and it stays in that shape, which is, I think, quite interesting. This type of principle has, of course, been used already in design. Here's some examples of people using these oxetic structures for shoes and dresses. Um, we added a few more, you know, just digitally. The curved hard stent one is kind of interesting right now. These expandable stents are pre-made straight cylinders, but um, there are some studies in medicine that show that, you know, if you conform them to the actual shape of the artery, um, they perform better. So, you know, in principle, this is just a digital rendering. In principle, you could now, you know, scan the artery, design your heart stent specifically for a specific patient. Um, so we also wanted to take it a step further. This was a, a longer project that um, was completed only this spring. Um, this is an aerial view of the EPFL campus, and there's this gaping hole here that we felt we need to fill. Um, so at some point, I convinced the university that we need to build an oxetic structure. And it was just completed recently. So this is a pavilion um, that's providing shading space for this barbecue station that is composed of these oxetic triangles that have been enlarged to hexagons here. It's a double membrane that is under tension by inserting a compression pole. So what's interesting here is that this surface is maximally expanded. Right? It's fully opened as in its programmed state. So it cannot expand anymore. It also cannot shrink because it's designed as a minimal surface. So there's a you know, a perfect balance um, between these types of um, mechanical principles. And it's become a favorite group for our, place for our group to have barbecues. So that's useful, you know, research finally paying off um, for us directly. Okay, uh, the second 
system I want to show you is also based on this uniform isotropic expansion. If you look at the, the oxetics, by the way, I can, I can pass this around, you can play with it. Um, this is what actually inspired this research. It's a metal sheet that has these um, slits cut in. Um, if many people, it's fine to destroy it, it will be destroyed by the end. Uh, but be careful, it has sharp corners, so once you pull on it and deform it, at some point bits and pieces come off. Um, so just to warn you, don't, don't cut yourself. But the idea of this system is really to transfer material within the plane, right? These triangles rotate within the plane, they expand, they create holes that open up. Um, but that has some limits because I can only actually with this system, the maximal amount of area increase that I can achieve is a factor four. So the area of the fully opened one compared to the fully closed one is a factor of four. And that limits the amount of expansion I can have and that limits the amount of curvature I can have. So for example, you can prove that the half sphere is the biggest possible part of the sphere that you can get. You cannot do more than a half sphere just because of these curvature limits. Now, the idea of the next project is to not transfer material within the plane, but to transfer it from the third dimension. We call this umbrella meshes because it's basically mimicking the mechanism of an umbrella. So here you see a rendering, hopefully, if it starts. So it's basically this kind of structure that as you compress it down, it expands transversely. Right? Really just a linkage that um, you know, transfers through rotation this material from the vertical dimension to the flat dimension. And you see with this uh, dashed line triangle how the structure expands. And now we can put them together and make you know, patterns of these, which when it runs. Of course, we now know when they're all the same, um, you know, they stay in the plane. And this is a, a little thing we built thanks to Henry's fantastic uh, kit of parts, right? We can make these structures that expand in the plane. And this is the very same principles as these oxetics. But now, what, what would Gauss say to this? Well, come on, we need variation in distances to get curvature, right? How can we get different expansion in these umbrellas? Well, very easily by making them um, at different heights. So if I take two of those together, one is higher than the other, then they will expand at different rates. And now, of course, the next step is clear, right? I take a grid, I change the heights, and then uh, at some point they become incompatible and they will buckle out of plane, as long as I make sure these beams are actually elastic, right? So Gauss, you know, there he is again. And then you can build these things and deploy them, and you see when you start deploying them to building, they stay flat, but at some point the incompatibility becomes too high um, and they buckle out of plane. So let me give you a, a brief glimpse on the computational um, aspect of this. And I want to give a big shout out to Uday and Samara, who sit back there. Raise your hands, don't be shy. Who actually built this whole system and made a lot of these prototypes. And also Florin, who's back there, who actually made all the physical models. So how does this work? Our focus is on inverse design. And inverse design means that we're not, um, you know, manipulating the heights of these umbrellas and then looking through simulation of what they give us. This is one way you can do design and often it can be very effective. If you change the parameters of your system, you run a simulation or you build the model and you look at what you get. But if you have a very specific design in mind, that process can be very inefficient. Right? So you, you don't want to have to choose all these different lengths by hand and hope to get to something like this shape. So what is our approach? The first thing is that we look at these geometric abstractions that I showed you before. So this isotropic expansion is something we can write down mathematically quite nicely. And we can use techniques that have been developed in computer graphics to compute a flattening, even of a rhino head, and in fact of any surface, into the plane. So specifically here we're using what's called conformal maps. And there's a lot of beautiful theory around this. Um, for example, you can show that any disc-shaped surface can be flattened conformally, which means in a way that preserves angles. So where everything you have is local isotropic expansion. So these type of geometric algorithms, they don't yet look at any bending or buckling or anything physical, but they give us an 
a first solution to a problem that is not so bad. So now if we get this first initial setup, we can run a simulation, and the simulation gives us a prediction of what the system looks like in static equilibrium. So now taking into account the bending and you know, internal stresses of the system. It's not quite there, but it's already quite decent. So now comes the second part, or the third part of the physical simulation, that is quite critical, and that is optimizing the design. So the optimization now actually changes the parameters of the rest state of the model such that when you deploy it, it goes to the shape that you care about. So I'll show you a little video. This is the initial state we start with. It's very subtle. You see these things go up and down, um, and you see how the shape more and more closely conforms to the target. So after this optimization, we now have a solution that if we run the physical simulation, will actually deploy accurately to um, the desired input shape. And this is very important to sort of couple the physical simulation and the optimization. So the physical simulation sort of runs in the inner loop of the optimization in order to be able to predict exactly what the shape will look like. Um, and then together, that allows you to close the loop you know, from an initial design to the final fabricable structure. One more thing I want to show you here. Um, so this is um, a comp composite of many of these little umbrellas. Here they all have the same heights. So you know, you're veterans by now, you know, that will just give us you know, a regular flat linkage. The computer is just there for scale. But now, Florin designed these things in a way that you can move these triangles up and down. Uh, I would need to unscrew it, it's a bit too much work to do now. But you can imagine I move these triangles up and down, which will actually change the length of each of these arms. So here's an example. And now this is exactly the same model, just changed slightly. And now it gives me, of course, a very different curvature, because I've changed the length. Or you can do this variant, and now you get the saddle. So now you have a reconfigurable system and I think that's quite exciting because you can you know, build a kit of parts, if you will, assemble these structures and deploy them into many different shapes depending on your needs. Okay, that was the first round, isotropic expansion. The next one I'm also very excited about. Um, and this is a project that was inspired when I visited Benoit's lab and Emmanuel was there and Jose. So they showed me this system of their barrowmores and their inflatables and we loved it a lot. So this is very impressive, and I hope you've seen the exhibition up there. It's brilliant, um, very, very nice. Uh, and this was sort of exactly what, what we like to do, you know, look at these type of physical systems and see if we can um, come up with some sort of inverse design method. So let me briefly explain the principle, but it's already been mentioned uh, before. The idea is to fuse um, two sheets of more or less inextensible material and inflate it. Right, so this is like an air mattress. Again, if everything is regular, nothing very interesting is happening. But again, if we use different types of patterns, then something interesting happens. And here's a little demo that um, I guess Jose made or Benoit made or Emmanuel made. <laughs> so actually I pass it around. Why don't you try it out? You can use this hand pump um, and then if you press this button, it will deflate. So you can explore, well, you know it, <laughs> what kind of shape that goes into. And of course, when, when Gauss saw this, he jumped out and said, yes, it's a variation of curvature. What I like about this system um, uh, is that the fabrication is so simple. So Florin built a little machine, um, which is basically a 2D plotter. So here you see him putting the sheets on. And then it's just a little laser that fuses them. There's different ways you could fuse these things together, of course. But you basically draw lines. You draw the lines where um, the, the material is supposed to bond together. And then you know, the um, inflation takes care of the rest. So we build a number of these prototypes. It's sort of very floppy, super thin, you know, less than 100 micron thick material, very weak in some sense. But once you inflate them, they go to the, the shape that you care about and become actually quite stiff and, and very strong. I think this is a, a very cool aspect of this work as well, that something very lightweight um, and very easy to make can create interesting shapes, but also structurally performant shapes. And even, as you can see in the exhibition upstairs, 
morphing shapes. You know, you can imagine that you know, if you change the pressure, if you add certain valves, open up ch channels, close others, you can get these things to behave in a, in a very interesting way. Um, so again, I'll very, on a very high level, go through the inverse design process. And it essentially consists of the same steps as before, at least on a high level. So importantly, again, that is that we use this geometric abstraction to understand the bulk behavior, if you will, of the system. So here, as I mentioned before, is this anisotropic uh, contraction. So what happens when you inflate these channels, as you can see that in the model that is being passed around, along the channel, the structure doesn't really change much in length. But across the channel, it contracts because you know, the volume pressure tries to maximize the volume. So these flat sheets turn into sort of spherical tubes. And that means they compress particularly. And this is something, again, that we can capture purely in geometric terms, right? So we can establish a mapping between the target shape that we care about, that the designer would provide us with, and the flat fused sheets curves. So again, this is a special type of parameterization that people in computer graphics have looked at for some time. The next step is to do a proper physical simulation so we can predict how this network of curves will actually deploy once we inflate it, right? So here we build sort of specialized physical models that you know, are accurate enough to give a good prediction, but simple enough, in some sense, to be able to run in the inner loop of an optimization, which is then the third step. And again, here the changes are subtle. Um, if, if I run this video, the structure changes slightly um, to, to really not only conform better to the shape, but also to reduce internal stresses. So these things are very important um, to do well because you know, if you don't do this sort of stress minimization or accurate physical modeling, you know, bad things can happen. Everybody's doing faces, so we do faces too. Here I'm just deflating it for dramatic effect. But of course, you, know, you can go the other way as well. OK, let me go to the last material system, uh, and this one is using a slightly different setup. Here we're looking more at a kind of mechanical linkage. So if I take you know, this sort of square, you can see how uh, I can change the shape within the plane. Now importantly, you would say, OK, the length of these beams doesn't change, right? But if you look at the length of the diagonals, for example, they do change. So again, this metric distortion that we're inducing in the surface, um, it doesn't have to, you know, it's not in this case so represented along these lines, but it's represented somewhere else. So there's clearly changes in length. If I take a regular pattern of these types of linkages, what's going to happen? Well, nothing much, right? It expands in the plane. This is always the same type or level of expansion, and Gauss tells us, well, if there's no variation, nothing interesting is happening. So now it's, it's easy to go to the next step. We make an irregular linkage. Now mechanically, if you do this, and you would do this with, let's say, you know, rigid steel bars or something, the linkage would just block. Right? It, you try to expand it, but there's incompatibility. It doesn't want to move anymore. But if you use flexible elements, then now you can get effects like this. Right? Now, as you hit the moment of incompatibility, some buckling is happening and the structure deploys into 3D. And then you can do other types of shapes um, that deploy into other things. Florin built prototypes, of course. Um, so here we just actuate them by pulling on them. Um, and you can see how you can go from this flat state to some curved shape. This was made of wood planks, which eventually broke, which conveniently uh, were cut out of the video. And then here is another shape that you can deploy. Florin being Florin, he wanted to do something bigger. So we decided to make a little pavilion. On the left, you see the flat layout. Um, these are glass fiber beams. You see all these little joints here. That was just a design constraint of this specific competition where they said everything has to fit in a box of one meter length, which was really sad for us because we had these six meter long beams that we had to cut into pieces and then reconnect. 
but fortunately that didn't prevent the system from working. Um, so as you pull this linkage out, it actually turns and closes into the spherical shape. It's a lot of fun to deploy it. Um, yeah, <laughs> we had great fun at this exhibition in Barcelona. Here you see it again um, at our campus where we reconstructed it. The fabric was then just added um, afterwards for you know, dramatic effect. It doesn't do anything structurally, it's just there to give the shape more, more volume and more surface. Okay, so this is a good moment to do a summary. Um, so what I talked about were different kind of you know, geometric principles to change distances within a surface. And we saw different types of realizations. We typically work at, you know, let's say the desktop to human scale, but a lot of the things in geometric terms are scale invariant, right? You can scale them up or down. Of course, when you look at the mechanics, this becomes different. And we've been exploring you know, different scales to see which effects take, take place when. Um, I want to stress that the physical simulation of these systems is very important. And what we learned in all of these projects is that out-of-the-box tools typically don't work well. So just putting it into your favorite FEM software is fine to analyze the structure and maybe to forward deploy one sample. But in our setting, we need to run these physical simulations sometimes hundreds or thousands of times within an inner loop of an optimization. So the inner loop uh, or the outer loop of the optimization changes the material parameters, the geometry of the pattern. If you take your standard FEM software, you have to sort of rebuild the model you know, and run it again, maybe it takes a few hours, and then you, know, you, not, you don't want to do hundreds of iterations. So building these physical simulation tools is very important. And here we're sort of hitting a dilemma in the sense that you know, we want them to be as accurate as possible. And it's very important that they're accurate enough to give you a good prediction of the final result. Otherwise, your optimization will not do anything meaningful if your physical simulation is too far off. So we want them to be as accurate as possible, but we need them to be as fast as possible. So a lot of work goes into designing them carefully, you know, simplifying the physical models to the extent that they give us the accuracy we need, but become efficient to evaluate. And then I, I want to stress that the geometric aspect of it, abstracting these um, physical mechanical principles into much simpler, let's say, geometric ones, is absolutely key. Because these optimization algorithms only work if you have a decent starting point. Now, what we're doing here is nonlinear gradient-based optimization. If we start from the wrong point, it will just you know, stop somewhere in some bad local minimum. So exploiting these geometric insights is key so that we get the bulk of the solution, basically, so that we can then apply these optimization tools. So this is the last time I'm going to show Gauss, I promise. So before I finish, I, I want to show you one more project. And this was actually sort of motivated in part by reflecting a little bit upon these type of material systems. So in order for us to do physical simulation, we need materials that kind of behave well, right? As in, um, we can calculate or measure their material properties. We need material models uh, of deformation, of bending, of stretching. And for this, you know, industrialized materials are, are nice. You can take glass fiber rods or plastic sheets because they have clearly specified material behavior, metals and so on. But somehow, you know, these are also wasteful and cause a lot of harm. So for the last project, uh, I want to introduce another one of our um, collaborators. And this is a picture from her garden. So this collaborator is Alison Martin, who is um, a weaving artist, a craftsperson with an incredible geometric intuition. And she started looking into bamboo just because she had it in her garden. And it was growing so fast that she needed to do something with it. And she, for those of you who know her, have seen her work, creates amazing installations of you know, straight strip weaving. Uh, we did this project, uh, Sabetta mentioned it earlier, with her on curved weaving. Um, but her main domain is working with these natural materials to build incredible structures. So we worked with her and we wanted to look at, you know, what can we do with bamboo? And if you look at bamboo, I mean, it's an incredible plant. It grows, you know, these bamboo poles grow to like 50 meters in a year, right? And then they harden out. But you can see on this picture, and I brought some samples. Oops. 
Um, every bamboo pole is different, right? And the material behavior is very different from one pole to the other. You can play with those as well. Um, so it's extremely difficult for us to model these accurately in our physical model, right? They're very inhomogeneous. They're, you know, not <laughs> characterizable by just Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, right? You need something else. Um, but I also show this project because in most of our work and most of the examples I showed you, we use fairly advanced technology, laser cutters, special built CNC machines, 3D printers. And for this project, we used very low tech tools. So we took these poles and this is one of Allison's bamboo splitters. So you basically just split them and then use another advanced tool to cut off these little bits and pieces. And what you end up with is these ribbons, I passed small ones around. And for us, the challenge was what can we do? Can we use these principles that we developed in the context of this X-Shell project, you know, these linkages, also at the level of bamboo? And what was very interesting to see is that even though these materials behave very different from one strand to another, if you put them together in a network, they cooperate with each other, these inhomogeneities sort of cancel out. So I'll show you a project where we built these type of um, linkage structures, but we assembled them into cylinders. So of course you can take a flat grid and roll it up and close it up into a cylinder. Right? Now these cylinders are very deployable. So here you see how, as I let this go, it collapses from this long thin thing to this wide round thing. And extremely flexible, extremely um, malleable in this way. And the question was, can we use something like a deployable structure of this kind to build something that is actually structurally efficient? So we made a lot of these cylinders. And the challenge was, you know, how do we take something like this, you know, as a, something that's so flexible and not strong in some sense and make something strong? And this is where sort of Allison's expertise came in and her experience with weaving. So the idea is to take several of these elements and weave them together so that they can mutually stabilize each other. So once you put three of them together in a specific way, there is sort of structural um, linkages being formed and triangles being formed in particular that avoid this shearing that you have in the cylinders. And when you do this, you can actually build fairly big things like this one, uh, which is now composed of 33 of these cylinders woven together at the nodes. And you see each of them is very flexible and very movable, but as a compound network, they form a very stable structure. Stable and lightweight, um, as you can see here. Um, so this structure is like four and a half meters high and 10 meters across, but you can easily lift it up. And it's flexible, it moves, right? But it's also quite stiff. And I'm very excited that only last week uh, we set it up again outside. Uh, so this is now on the EPFL campus. And what's more is you see these um, feet resting on flower pots. So now we have plants that grow over the structure. Um, and sort of nature will reclaim in some sense uh, what, what it is owed. And I think that's, that's sort of a nice metaphor. And I think it's also sort of a a question or a challenge, you know, in our work specifically, we work a lot with industrial materials. Um, and I would like to, you know, think about how we can use sort of geometric insights, all this technology we build in computing and making and fabrication to maybe reconnect a bit more with nature and not discard these natural materials that are difficult to work with. It's hard to model them precisely but kind of try to find ways in which we can do this to not have to work with plastics and, and you know, a lot of these wasteful materials. So that's sort of my challenge to all of you and I'm excited that so many students are here who hopefully can pick up some of these ideas. Um, I think it was mentioned early in the morning that we are facing some, some crises and it would be nice if this sort of co collective uh, intelligence in this room can help to solve some of these problems. So again, I invite you to look up you know, for more details on our website. Uh, and I'm very excited to, to share more interactions and thoughts with you throughout the day. Thank you.
plus a five G um sync routing for for sure. But usually there's something that's like Spyware like or like the first talks that I set or something that gives you like the fine for the um for for the the s- sending. The Russians are particularly for like hyperbolic structures there's so many different ways of embedding those in space. Particularly for that one uh was it C sixty one Yeah. So this is is a very good point. So the the geometric abstraction and I think that's sort of a theme that runs through this workshop, you know, to look at how metric changes induce shape change and then curvature um, is only capturing a certain part of the story, right? This is an abstraction, obviously. And if you look particularly at the saddle point, right? So as it contracts and, you know, it needs to sort of buckle out of plane, um, there is no, um, there's a symmetry breaking going on. It's a bunch of concentric circles. It could buckle in many different ways. And that's not clearly determined, right? So there's an indeterminacy there. And this is something that runs a little bit deeper. And that's why um, this physical simulation is so important. This geometric abstraction of a surface is not real, right? It is an abstraction. If you look at a system like this, for example, which has, of course, it comes out of the third dimension to go into the plane, you know, it really matters how these beams bend and how they bend as a volumetric structure. So the geometry, the purely geometric aspect of it captures some, and I'd hopefully large enough fraction of the overall behavior, but then the physical simulation, minimizing bending energies and actually capturing that behavior is critical. And I think that there is a lot of room for, for more you know, research and more innovation because, I mean, Gaussian curvature also doesn't determine the surface uniquely, right? I mean, mean curvature is not determined. Like this, this thing has zero Gaussian curvature in all of these conformations. So there's more uncertainty. With the umbrellas, for example, we exploited an additional degree of freedom. And that is the fact that I can change the heights from the top and the bottom. If I do it symmetrically, you know, there's sort of, it could buckle this way or that way. But if I do it non-symmetrically, then I now have the ability to also you know, capture what some aspects of the mean curvature of the surface and then get to a more determined system. Yeah, I mean, in principle, I think the, the, the key thing that we exploit is the fact that we can control the amount of expansion by changing the size of these triangles in these patterns, right? We can say, this linkage has almost zero resistance to expansion, but once it's fully expanded, it becomes stiff, right? So by scaling these triangles, we can actually say, I want this part of the surface to expand isotropically by 10%, this by 20, this by 80, Right? And that way we can program this, this distribution. But of course, I mean, here we, we're building it as a linkage. Um, the other examples, I think I have some here. These are the bistable ones, which you just cut out of. Um, I can pass those around. They're easily destroyed, but don't worry. It's okay. If you're gentle, they might make it all the way to the end of the room. Um, but we're basically just exploiting the fact that we can control very much, you know, it's sort of a very non-linear kind of behavior. It's very weak and it becomes very stiff. And that gives us a sharp cutoff point. Of course, you could use purely elastic aesthetics, yeah. but then you have a, a different response, right? As you pull more, they will stretch more. So it's more difficult to program one specific target shape. These ones, they will expand and then they will stop. And you have to pull quite a bit, probably, you know, you have to break them but they're not actually changing shape anymore. This gives us the ability to sort of more precisely and more targetly program this target shape into the structure.
Yeah, so um, I mean, all of the systems I showed you use very different physical models. Uh, I guess your, your, your question is getting at whether we use data-driven uh, simulation. So um, not really, and to some extent, I'm not fully convinced that that's the right approach. Um, it depends what you have, right? In our case, we have actually very precise mechanical models of the system that we're looking at. We have equations that essentially describe the physical behavior. So what I think makes sense is to use machine learning techniques maybe to simplify the computation. What I don't think is that necessarily the right approach is to run you know, thousands of simulation and then just throw a deep net at it. Because at that point, you're basically throwing away the physical knowledge that you have. If you have data, if you have measurements, absolutely. Right? This is where machine learning excels. If you have a million images, you can train models of what it means to be a cat, which is difficult to put in a differential equation. But if you have a mechanical system that is actually well described, just running simulations and then throwing away all the knowledge that you have about them and just training a net seems to me the wrong approach. On the other hand, what people are doing is, of course, to use these techniques of neural networks, which are basically ways to you know, do high dimensional nonlinear function interpolation to build surrogate models that allow you to do this optimization in a faster way. So if you have a simulation that's very slow, then maybe neural networks can be used to speed it up and in that way do this inverse design optimization faster. That I think is quite promising. Yes, a lot of surprises. <laughs> and um, at the beginning, I was terrified. So I, thought, you know, I looked at our model and I said, oh, they're, you know, they're so clean and nice and assume everything is perfect. This will never work. Um, but then I, I learned a lot of things. And we're now we're, we're taking this a step further and you know, going away from these straight cylinders to more uh, elaborate structures. Um, I think the ultimate insight, and, and Allison brought this into the project, was that it's not so much about the specific physical behavior of bending and twisting of these beams. It's really just mostly about the lengths, right? So, and bamboo doesn't stretch much, right? And if you have different strands, they all don't stretch much. So as long as you get the lengths right and you have this pattern where it's not dependent on one single strand, right? Obviously, you know, if you put pressure on one strand and you know, they're all different, some will break and some won't, but if you have a network where they all work together and where the forces equal out, this is actually a very robust system. So this was surprising and very interesting to me. That's why I'm now very motivated to pursue this further because if you bring sort of the geometry into it and this concept of networking, if you will, I think you can build a lot of predictable and strong structures out of very unpredictable materials. All right, copy.